seated, I want you to now think with me. We're going to do a short bird lesson. I know some of you love birds, some of you, you know, they're in the way and they make a mess, okay? But I want you just to think next time, and, and whether you're, you're seeing the, the geese as they're starting to move around and, and uh, start migrating, or whether you're watching the ones in your lawn or at your little theater, I want you to think about birds. Because one of the disciplines of science ornithology or the study of birds is in a quandary to evolutionary thought because birds are designer dependent they could not mathematically have evolved okay no matter what the textbook says you cannot find enough calculations to make everything that is packed into a bird happen and mutate and evolve did the bird here's the the problem evolutionists have did the birds evolve first or second in the rise of animals? In other words, did they just come out of the, the primeval goo as birds, or did they come as something else and then become birds? Okay, because that's a real problem. It's almost unbelievable to watch a creature that can so uniquely adapt to the air, and it's become a flying wedge that swims through the air as effortlessly as a fish dr- just drifts through the sea. It's impossible to think that that, that creature came from water drifting to air drifting and and how mathematically you could have enough uh, mutations for it to get or evolutions for it to get there. For just a moment, ponder with me the designer-dependent creatures we call birds. This world is filled with birds and each bird cries out for the need for an intelligent designer because from the very center inside of them, their bone structure all the way out to the, the, the furthest reaches of their feathers, every part of a bird has been designed. One bird, I want to talk to you about uh, the ouzel. Probably most of you have never heard of an ouzel, okay, but you'll all look it up on Google when you get home, okay? If you could sail alongside of a bird in flight and notice its form as it flew, you would be witnessing from beak to the last tail feather an absolute study in complete streamlining. I mean, birds have the ability to absolutely make their form to, to float through the air. In all the world of biology, there is no creature more perfectly equipped to resist the laws of gravity than birds. A bird can float through the air like the down of a milkweed pod and yet weigh as much as 20 pounds. How? How do they do it? Because nearly every part of the bird's framework, its anatomy, and even some of its quills are hollow and air-filled. Uh-huh, okay, that's good. We kind of knew that, right? When you played with bird feathers, you notice they were easy to bend because they're hollow. So, so far, so good. But a bird also has a much higher body temperature than mammals do. And so this trapped air inside these hollow spaces is heated much like the power of hot air balloons that float. Last night I was working on this and the kids all went, Dad, Dad, you can hear it. And there was... Where we live in Portage, there was a balloon coming by, and it was so close that you could hear the, you know, when that, how does that not burn the, you know, there's this flame about 20 feet high. I don't know how it doesn't burn the bag, but I, I'm not into balloon design, but God's into bird design, and their, their, their hollow bones have air trapped in it, and much like that hot air balloon rises because of the heat, and the, the, you know, remember, uh, heat rises and cold drops. The heat makes it rise because the air is colder than the hot air, and the, so the balloon can rise through the cold air. That's the same principle that God built into birds. And so the balloons around the skies of Kalamazoo that you see are much like the birds. Both have air trapped at a higher than atmospheric point, so they both are buoyant. Now, go from... Birds we see around here to the oozel, okay? That's a water bird. Think of water birds that can float atop water like oil because of this hollow air filled design. But how do water birds sink to the bottom and feed off the materials they need for life? Remember, these birds sit atop water, but what they eat is at the bottom, they're bottom feeders. Perhaps there's probably no more vivid signature of God on any bird in the world than upon the bird he ideally fitted to live by Pacific mountain streams. And that bird is called the Pacific Oozel. And that bird is one of my favorite of all. 
Out west, where the streams run fast, where waters are cold and white, with foam of waterfalls, if you were to watch closely, you would find God's witness to creation, the ouzel. Of all the birds cataloged and studied in ornithology, none are more buoyant than the ouzel. Like grease poured onto water, they float above even the roughest waves. Now, a lot of birds you see, they kind of sit in the water. You look at a duck, you know, it's kind of mm, about that far in, you know, and then the rest of it's out. You know, they kind of are floating, but they're not really on the water. They're in the water, not oozles. Oozles sit on the water. Their whole body is above the water. They just sit on top of the water. In fact, they look like smoke if you look at them closely. And so the oozel actually floats above the water in contrast to the partially submerged bodies of ducks and geese. Now, if you were to train your binoculars and look at a floating oozel out there, and they, they usually stay right where the rocks and the waterfalls are hitting the water. They just stay right there, just kind of like little battleships, just darting around on the top. They're just, they're just darting on top of the water. But all of a sudden, as you're looking through your binoculars, if you aren't watching carefully enough, you'll see that he disappeared. And you don't know where he went. That oozel that was sitting just like smoke atop the water is gone. Just like a magician took him away. Well, scientists wondered about that, and so they put in underwater cameras. And they find that the oozel goes straight to the bottom like an oversized lead sinker on a boy's fishing line. The oozel can hit the bottom instantly. It can go from floating like smoke, not in the water like a duck, but on the water like grease, and it just disappears, and the cameras show them hitting the bottom just like a rock. Now, how does that oozel do that? Well, if you could see it, it would be walking calmly down the bottom of the stream, feeding on its favorite delicacies as firmly as if it was made of lead. How can the most buoyant bird on the earth walk firmly through the current of a stream at the bottom? That's the first thing scientists said. They said, how can it go from floating to walking, just walking along and picking up whatever it wants at the bottom of the river? Well, if you keep watching it underground with a, or underwater with a camera, you'll find once its beak is filled to the brim with what it decides it wants, it wades out of the water onto the stream bank. So, so this thing all of a sudden will show up walking with a mouthful out of the stream and up onto the shore. It swallows its feast, it shakes itself off, and in a second it's back floating on top of the water like smoke. All this happens only because of the designer-installed equipment that the oozel carries. It has strong muscles surrounding its body so that at will it can completely expel all of the trapped air within it, causing its weight to be sufficient to sink it to the bottom and walk about. Now, to float like a cork or sink like a stone at will is an impossible ability to evolve by chance. No human could conceive, design, or even modify such an apparatus as this lowliest member of the class of Genesis 1.21. It is designer dependent. Can you imagine how many versions of birds would have had to evolve that drowned while, while we were trying to evolve this process, it would go down and then it was stuck and it would drown and it would go and become a fossil. And then another one would down and it would try and walk. Can you imagine how many billions of years it would have taken before they all drowned and we lost the species? Yet in the beginning... God, in a moment of creation, designed the magnificent Pacific oozel and countless other marvels which float about the earth, all of them declaring the glory of God. Now that's just a fun illustration. But I want you to turn now with me back a little bit more from Job to Nehemiah. It's just before it. Okay, just go back. Esther, Nehemiah. Just two books back. We're backing through the Bible this morning. Nehemiah chapter 9. Because this is important. Because every time a hiker comes on a mountain stream and pulls out his binoculars and watches the display of a creative genius built right into every single Pacific oozel, that bird is shouting out the reality that God created it. Okay? Every time you see one of the intricacies of this universe, whether out there telescopically or, or up close microscopically or, or with your binoculars at the animal world, every time we look, if we pause and adjust our mind to the reality of the God of the Bible... We know He's the God of creation. And it causes us who know Him 
to enlarge our capacity to worship him. But look at Nehemiah chapter 9, ninth chapter of Nehemiah, and verse 5. And as you get to the fifth verse, you're in the start of one of the greatest recorded prayers in the Bible. Uh, when I read through the Bible, each time I study something different, one time I went through and studied every prayer in the Bible, and this, this is one of the most magnificent, longest, fullest prayers in all the Bible. And the fifth verse, if you look at this worship-filled prayer, which is also the longest in the Bible, listen to these words. Right in the middle of verse 5, I'll start. Stand up and bless the Lord your God. Verse 6, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that are in them, and you preserve them all, and the host of heaven worships you. You know, the the second reason why I believe the Bible is true because of the absolute scientific accuracy that God said only He could have designed this universe, the animal world, and us who bear His image. And that causes me, in the words of Nehemiah 9 and verse 5, to say, you alone are the Lord. 